film this part. Uh, <laughs> I've been asked to encourage you downstairs after the session to network and grab refreshments. I'm also supposed to recommend, and I do recommend, that you would complete an event feedback form, pop it into one of the fish bowls, and you will have a chance to win a ticket to SQL Server Live. I don't know where that is or when that is, but you can get a ticket to that. OK, Orlando December, or a SQL tool belt during the draw at 5.30. I'm not sure if you have to be present to win. Furthermore, you should be encouraged to stay around for the drink celebration, which goes on until 7 PM, lots of time. If you drink one drink every 15 minutes, you can get really, really, really hammered by 7 PM. <laughs> so they're giving you full latitude. So go you know, take full advantage, please. So this will take place starting at 5.05. And you can also get a Red Gate goodie bag t-shirt and a SQL Server book. All right? Is this thing a little weird sounding, or is it me? Oh, has it? Is there a sound tech, or is it just you? OK. It's OK? All right. I, like, I can hear that it sounds weird, so all right. Cool. So let me get into my presenter mode here. <laughs> Monitoring, if properly configured, properly implemented, properly used, should be an ally, should be like another member of your team. It should be something that's there to catch you when you have a problem. It should be something that you can rely on. It should be something that just works, that you don't have to think about all the time, and that you shouldn't have to think about all the time. Unfortunately, this is not the case. Reality is, monitoring sucks. And monitoring should not suck. <laughs> but what I've found time and time again is that monitoring systems are either over-configured where you have way too much stuff going on, way too much information coming back from the monitoring system, and you're overwhelmed. Uh, monitoring systems are maybe under-implemented, where you don't have enough stuff coming back from the monitoring system. You really need to find that balance. It's a Zen thing. This could have been called Zen and the Art of Monitoring, but I did a talk called Zen and the Art of Something last year at PASS. So I didn't want to repeat that. But it's a balance thing, you know? And it's Kind of diff it seems like it's difficult to get that balance because no one gets that balance, but it really isn't that difficult. Um, you, we just need kind of us to do a little bit of work, and we need the vendors to do a little bit of work. We are here at Redgate's event, so I'm going to be showing some screenshots from their SQL Monitor product, which does actually a pretty good job of striking that balance. But what I'm talking about today, I believe, can be applied to any monitoring solution that you run in your environment. So let's move it from never quite right to just right. And in my quest to find this information, I looked out and I wondered, why has no one gotten this right? So I climbed the mountain to Redmond. <laughs> and little did you know, Redmond is a fiery realm. It's not watery, as one might expect here in Seattle. And I climbed the mountain, and I knelt down, and I asked for guidance, and here's an artist's rendering of me receiving this guidance. <laughs> I was given information to bring back to you, and that is what we're going to discuss today. Very quickly, a bit about me. I uh, come from Boston, where I am a SQL Server developer, I guess. Um, work primarily in the financial services industry, doing data warehousing work. I'm also very, very interested in monitoring. I've written a monitoring store procedure called SPU is Active that I hope some of you use. Uh, and uh, I've also done a lot of work with baselining systems and uh, kind of thinking about how monitoring should be in the correct version of the world, not the world we are necessarily currently in. I've written a few books. Uh, I do a lot of speaking and training and stuff. I'll be speaking at PASS for those of you who are attending. I, is everyone here attending PASS? Anyone not? Oh, wow. OK. Well, you guys can still register. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm speaking on Thursday at PASS, Thursday morning in room 6E. So you can come check me out there, and that should be a pretty good talk. And please visit sequelblog.com. We have about 40 uh, pretty good SQL bloggers on there. The blog. Uh, 
good content on a regular basis. So with that, let's discuss the Ten Commandments, which I believe if you follow these ten things, not necessarily to the letter, but pretty close, um, your monitoring is going to be much easier, you're going to get more sleep, and you're going to have a better time at work. And is Jeremiah still around? Probably not. I guess he bailed. As he would say, you're going to have more time to look at cat pictures. So I don't like cats, so I don't look at cat pictures, but I like other baby animals like elephants and uh, baby pandas. Very cute. If you want to send me animal pictures, no cats, please. But anything else is fine. So first and foremost, and this is going to be the theme that we revisit throughout the talk, alerts must be actionable. What do I mean by action? What I mean is that for every alert that comes in, you should be able to go do something as a result of the alert to fix it. If you cannot fix the alert, then you should be able to go do something to turn off the alert and stop <laughs> it coming through the system. Time and time again, I've been to shops where alerts are coming in, and it's like, oh, there's the alert that comes every night at 2 AM. Yeah, yeah, see, everyone's nodding, because this happens to everyone. This, why, this is why monitoring sucks, <laughs> because alerts are not actionable, and they waste our time. Every single alert that comes through that we cannot action is a useless waste of time, and it erodes our confidence in the alerting system. And it erodes our ability to understand what is a good alert when a good alert comes through. And we'll talk about that more in a bit. Uh, this can cause serious, serious problems. So if there's one thing you do, just maybe once a day even, you can look at the alerts that you've received that day and try to go through and figure out which ones were actionable, which ones weren't, and maybe start turning things off. Adjust thresholds up if you need to. Uh, play with things a bit. Don't just leave it there. Don't just install the alerting package uh, or the monitoring package and leave it configured right out of the box the way that it was. That doesn't help anyone. So that's the number one thing. Now, let's talk about a few common meaningless alerts. CPU percent spike. This is probably the one I see the most often. That's why it's the first on the list. 2 AM, your pager goes off. CPU high. What are you going to do about it? Does it matter? Who cares? No, if the CPU was high for like 30 seconds at 2 AM, no one in the world cares. No one was impacted. That is a completely non-actionable alert. Now, if the CPU was high for a half hour, like sitting at 100%, OK, maybe now there's something we want to do. If the CPU um, you know, was high and everything was slow as a result, so we have some correlation, maybe there's something we want to do. But most of these alerts are like, oh, CPU went up for like one second. Boom, send out an alert, page everyone, wake everyone up in the middle of the night. This is terrible. Uh, another one, high connection count. What are you going to do about it? What does that mean? Does that mean that you're doing a lot of business? So you got a lot of connections, which is a good thing. Does it mean that something went wrong? Usually, it doesn't mean anything bad. So why are you looking at it? Uh, long running query. This is another one. Uh, people have these ideas that they need to have SLAs in their applications. Probably not a bad idea. Uh, we want to keep all the queries going through quickly. But what constitutes a long running query? A lot of these alerts I see, they'll be like, any query over three seconds, we're going to send out a message. And then, oh, oops, some query somewhere ran for over three seconds once, and we got a page about it. Oh, now I have to go look, and looks like autostats kicked in on that query. Bummer. One-time thing. No reason to rouse me from bed in the middle of the night for a one-time thing. If it keeps happening, again, what we're looking for is repeated patterns. We're looking for excessive uh, conditions that are continuous and that aren't stopping. We don't want to look for instantaneous things. Uh, high memory utilization, that's my favorite one. I just bought a box with 500 gigs of memory, but I'm going to create an alert so that when SQL Server does what it's supposed to do and actually uses the memory, hmm, maybe I should just take a stick out of the box and turn off the alert, and then it won't get there. What do you think? <laughs> I don't know. It could work. Uh, again, configure the memory where you want it to be uh, and let it go there. Come on. <laughs> it's not rocket science. It's just a matter of thinking about what we actually want to do, which is fix real problems and not waste our time, right? So number two, 
alerts must include sufficient information. And by this, I mean sufficient information to make them actionable. actionable. So what this means is that if I receive an alert that says SPID 123 was blocking SPID 456, and that's oftentimes all those alerts say, right? Is SPID 123 was blocking SPID 456. So I log in, and both have now finished. And does SQL Server keep any history on what SPID 123 was running or what SPID? Four? No. Nothing at all. Completely non actionable. So what do I need? I need some info. <laughs> I want, with every alert, host names. I want to know um, what hosts those queries were coming from. Are they coming from certain app servers and not from certain other app servers? I want program names. Uh, most of the databases that I see are shared. A lot of different applications are using them. Is it possible that one application is running a bad query and another one is running a better query? I want to know. I want to be able to aggregate up this information and look at patterns and look at what's going on across the entire uh, infrastructure. Queries, I want to know what queries those SPIDs are running. This is very easy to get out of the DMVs. You can use that sort procedure I mentioned earlier, SP who is active, or you can write your own DMV queries or whatever. But send me the query. If you don't send me the query, the whole thing is a waste of time. Uh, logins, I want to know who's logging in doing this, obviously. Competing processes and server stats. I want to know what else was running on the server. Is it possible that every night some backup program is kicking in that's causing everything to kind of go downhill? Yes, it's very, very possible. So what we want to be able to do is see that quickly and understand it. So as I said, I'm going to show some screenshots from SQL Monitor. This is one case that SQL Monitor does a very nice job. In SQL Monitor, every time there's an alert, uh, a lot of information is captured. SQL Monitor is always capturing this information. But whenever there's an alert, it uh, puts these nice little green bars up for us. And these are just some of the metrics that it captures. But you can see it very easily lets you see the state of the server just before and just after the exception. So you can really get a good feeling for what's going on. Along with this, SQL Monitor also captures most of the other information I listed before. So this is a case where this product does a pretty good job. If your product is not doing this good a job, uh, so if you're not using SQL Monitor yet, um, right? Isn't that the point of this? Um, <laughs> then tell your vendor to do a better job or you'll switch to SQL Monitor. Pretty cool that you attended this event, huh? Anyway, let's move on. Avoid magic. Never trust magic. Um, what is magic in this case? What's a magic threshold? This is a threshold that either you don't understand, you read about it somewhere, um, you don't understand it, you don't know why it's there, but someone said, this is the threshold you should use. That's magic. That doesn't mean anything to you, but you're looking at it. Uh, anything that you don't understand or that you can't explain or show in your environment is useless information. There's no threshold I've ever seen uh, power must be on. Okay, there's a good threshold. That's maybe one of the only thresholds <laughs> that I can think of that uh, is you know, valid across the board. Other than that, everything is fully dependent upon the environment, fully dependent on the applications, fully dependent on what's going on. So if you take some random threshold that you read off the net, uh, two bad things can happen. Number one is it's just wrong for your environment. Number two is you don't understand the metric, so when it fires, it is not actionable. actionable. <laughs> There's nothing you can do if you don't understand what the metric means. My recommendation is, in your monitoring environment, if there's something you don't understand, turn it off. Because it's just a waste of your time. You can always turn it on later. Don't worry, you're not going to lose anything. Maybe you'll lose something, but you know what? It's already lost if you don't understand it. So um, start small and build. Don't try to start with the world. And, uh, and figure everything out at once. You'll, you'll never get there. It's craziness. So anyone uh, know any of these magic thresholds before I flip to the next slide and reveal my top list? Like batch requests per second. Batch requests per second. That's a good one. Fragmentation. Sorry? 30% fragmentation. 30% fragmentation for a rebuild. I like that one. PLE. Any others? Sorry? Disk time for reads and writes. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting one, actually. That's almost. A good one. Sorry? Disk queue length. Oh, that's a good one. Any others? OK, let's see which one. Whoa, what in the world? OK. That was magic. 
OK, so here are my top list. Um, PLE, page life expectancy, is the biggest one. Uh, this is the amount of time that a page is um, expected to live in the buffer cache once it's loaded in. It's just like an average time. And the buffer cache ages out pages when they haven't been touched for a while, um, and other stuff needs to get read in. So there was some article written by some Microsoft guy, like, I don't know, in 2000 or 2001 or something like that. And it said that, so PLD's in um, the increment is seconds. So it said PLD must be above 300 or you have a problem. Um, and it, this was, I don't even know if that's what it said. It probably said, like, we recommend that you keep PLE above 300 in general or some, you know, random wording like that. But a ton of people took this as gospel, and people went crazy over this metric, and they were treating it as this magic bullet, like the first thing you should look at anytime you have a performance problem. What's your PLE? What's your PLE? Like, you'd see it on forums and all over the place. I got asked in interviews probably 10 different times. Uh, to dis define PLE and explain the value, guess what? It means nothing. If your disk system is keeping up just fine, a, then a low PLE just means you're doing more disk reads. The user might not feel that at all. Uh, it's really, it's maybe indicative of that you're doing more disk work than you need to, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have a problem, um, or at least not a short-term problem. Maybe it's something you need to look at going forward, but it's not something you need to jump out of bed in the middle of the night to look at. And that's what we're talking about here. Uh, disk queue length. Disk queue length is basically, in 2012, on modern disk systems, completely meaningless. Stop looking at it. means nothing. What we want to look at is disk latency. We want to know how long. SQL Server is very chatty on the disk, right? So it creates a lot of outstanding requests, which builds up the disk queues. Uh, but ideally, each of those requests should be getting processed really, really quickly. Um, so it'll be in line, but it'll get through the line like in a, you know, a millisecond or less than a millisecond or something like that. Um, so disk queue link just says there's lots of outstanding requests. It doesn't say anything about how long it's actually taking those requests to get through. So if you're looking at this, please just turn it off. Instead, look at um, seconds per read and seconds per write. And those are the actual metrics you want to look at. I'm not going to tell you what number to look at because you want to look at what is normal on your server, baselining. <laughs> look at what is normal understand what is normal, and then alert when things go out of normal range. That's what good monitoring is all about. The other one is disk percent used. The reason that this is an interesting metric, uh, an interesting magic metric, <laughs> um, is that people will set alerts on disk percent used, and they'll set like one for the entire environment. So imagine that you have LUNs or disk units or whatever of different sizes throughout the environment, and you set an alert to fire every time any of them exceeds 85% full. It's not necessarily falling within my definition of magic before, but it's something I've seen cause a lot of problems. So maybe you have um, some administrator somewhere uh, set the C drive to 16 gigs. Why do they do that, by the way? It's craziness. Anyway, they set the C drive to 16 gigs. Now on there, an 85% full alert makes a lot of sense. But you have someone else over here. Uh, you have a two terabyte volume. And does that 85% alert make as much sense there? Probably not anymore. So magic is also getting rid of uniform alerting in general and baselining instead, looking at what is normal and then looking at what's different. Now, I'm going to go ahead and put Redgate on the spot here. None of the vendors do a good job of baselining. None of them, not Redgate. Not anyone else. So uh, Redgate's not doing any less than the industry average. <laughs> but uh, they do provide a little bit of functionality here. What you can do in SQL Monitor uh, is you can go to any of the metrics, get this nice graph. And if you scroll down up there in time range, you can do comparative graphing. So here we can look at today versus yesterday, this month versus last month, this week versus last week. So we can use our eyes to kind of gauge how things are going. Now, ideally, this is a call to Redgate. Uh, this would all be automated and would use statistics algorithms. And uh, you'd get an alert when things go out of range. But that's not the reality today. So talk to those guys during the beer, what do they call it? Networking. Networking reception. Yes, talk to them during that time while you're drinking your 15 beers. And uh, I'm sure they'll be happy to help you. Well, hopefully. So. Um, next, alerts should not make excessive noise. What does that mean? That means if you're getting um, alerts coming in and filling your inbox, 
every second, what's going to happen? Very, very, very quickly. You, yes. Someone just said, boy, who cried wolf. That's what it says on the next slide. Thank you. So <laughs> you're going to stop paying attention to the alerts. And you'll miss the really critical And you'll miss them. Yes, you will. Um, this is just, and this happens so often. Um, true story. Well, mostly true. Uh, I was sitting, I went to this uh, startup, and I was doing some work for them, some development work. And I was sitting, and I was having this chat with the uh, development manager there. And we're having a nice conversation. And right outside her cube is this QA guy. And um, he's one of these really ridiculous people that you meet at startups working in QA positions, uh, which is to say, um, A, they have no technical skill whatsoever. Um, B, and that's why they're in QA. Well, I'm not insulting all QA people. I'm mainly <laughs> insulting the QA people who work for startups who have no technical skill whatsoever, of which I've met a lot. There are good QA people out there. Don't get me wrong. This guy was not. Um, so, and it was a startup, and they're allowed to like, so he's this ridiculous, um, he's wearing like a Slayer shirt, and he has like a big wallet chain. And um, anyway, we're sitting there, and the door busts open, and this guy runs in, and his desk is literally like to that wall, and here's the door. He's huffing and puffing, and I think there's a tear running down his face. Um, he's also in charge of monitoring, I should add. Um, and he comes in, and he's like, the server is down, and no one knows why. And uh, anyway, he's like freaking out. Um, the woman I'm talking to, she's totally, one, she's like the kind of person you want to be in management. Totally cool. She just kind of sits back. She goes, huh, that's weird. I didn't get an alert uh, that anything was wrong. And OK, so I'm a consultant. And at that moment, my mind clicks in. I'm like, ching. And I'm thinking about the, um, <laughs> The work I'm going to do. And uh, yeah, I was like, what color Lamborghini do I want anyway? Uh, so as it turned out, they did have an alerting system. Yes, they did. But they had had a meeting the week before. And everyone had said, you know what? We're getting too many alerts. We can't deal with them. So the solution was, no, they didn't turn it off. Um, someone from a central location went through, and I actually stepped behind the, the, the director's desk and looked at our screen. She had Outlook up. Um, this is after she thought about it for a minute and realized. Um, someone had gone through and actually configured Outlook on everyone's somehow centrally to create a folder called Alerts. <laughs> and it looked something like that. <laughs> True story. So yeah, we opened it up. There was the alert. We fixed it. Later, we're discussing something else. And I'm like, oh, did you get that email I received last week? And she's like, oh, I need to go to another folder for that. And she was obviously very smart um, about the way she handled her emails from me. So as I said, she's the kind of person you want to be in management. Um, don't hire QA guys if they're wearing Slayer t-shirts, please. All right? So don't let your alerting system get into this situation. Turn off the bad alerts, all right? So next. I just told you alerts should not make excessive noise. Alerts must make enough noise. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that if you're firing an alert and then forgetting, you've heard the term fire and forget, I would assume. I know Roger's heard the term fire and forget in a different context. Um, service broker, architect, Roger Walter. Um, fire and forget is not what you want for your alerting system. What you want to have happen is you want it to fire. And what if, let's pretend um, that you have some IT guy and he's on call. He's supposed to be getting the alerts and processing them. And what if there's some email glitch? Because email glitches happen, and he doesn't get the alert in his email. And you fired it. And now what? Well, if it was an actionable real alert, then something bad Right? So you don't forget. You want to keep sending them. Not very often, though. So it's kind of a balance. Another, again, it's a question of balance. How often do you want to keep sending the alerts? I don't know. Maybe once every, maybe it depends on the severity of the alerts. Maybe once every 15 minutes or 20 minutes for low severity alerts. Maybe your baselining your response time. Baselining your response time. Wow. Now you're getting really crazy. <laughs> so. We can't, we can't do that. We can't even baseline the metrics that we need to run the alerts. How are we going to baseline our response time? So if 
Yes. <laughs> That's a good way to come up with the right answer. It's never going to happen right away. So that's a good way to come up with the right answer, but it's not going to happen in, right away. You say, I'm going to bet 10 years we could have this conversation again, and <laughs> we're going to be having the same conversation. But yeah, I love, love the thought process. Let's um, get Redgate to implement it. Um, in the meantime, make sure your system keeps sending alerts, and make sure that someone has to go somewhere and acknowledge receipt of that alert. This is how you do it in SQL Monitor. You go in and you clear the alerts. Uh, there's a little window and you click the alert that you want to clear and you click select cleared and then everyone knows that you got the ball. You're running with that alert. We don't need to worry about it anymore. All right, this is what you want to make sure your monitoring system has because if it doesn't, that means stuff is going to get lost and it will. I believe so, yes. Okay. Any players that just send out a notification that it's cleared? I don't believe so. Is there someone from the SQL, well, at least not that I've seen. Is there someone from the SQL monitor team here? No, it doesn't. Okay. There's your confirmation. Thank you. You just cleared that alert. <laughs> Very nice. All right. So on that note, set multiple alert thresholds. What does this mean? Let's think about that disk full issue again. 85%? That's one threshold. Um, does that mean that we have impending doom or that somewhere far off in the distance there's an issue? Well, it depends on the size of the disk, right? Which is why that's a bad alert in general. But let's pretend like it's a good alert and we'll say 85%. Mm, okay, maybe that means we're starting to have a little problem. Uh, maybe 90% means we need to look at this, and maybe 95% means if we don't fix this, things are going down in an hour. So yes, we do need someone to get out of bed in the middle of the night. And that's really all there is to it. It's kind of along the same lines as making sure that things are noisy enough. And so here's some of the candidates I have for that. Um, disk percent full, as I just mentioned. CPU time, um, that's another good one for this. If, again, a CPU spike we don't care about. But maybe we do care about an extended um, you know, CPU all the way up at 100%. So maybe we give an alert at 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, something like that. Increasing severity, increasing uh, number of people on the alert or whatever you need. Maybe uh, the first alert just goes out by email and uh, more severe alerts go out on the pager, whatever. You can figure that out. Uh, number of SQL worker threads. This is a big one uh, that I see a lot because I mess around with stuff I'm not supposed to. And, um, SQL Server has a certain number of worker threads, and it's kind of a cool behavior. Um, do you know what happens if you exceed the number of worker threads that SQL Server is configured for? Well, actually, your phone rings. You get a phone call. Not from SQL Server, from your users, because no one will be able to connect to the server anymore. So I call this built-in monitoring in SQL Server, and um, it works quite well. Unfortunately, you don't want that phone call because that means you're already down, you're toast. So um, number of worker threads, you want to put a percentage on there. And then baselines, uh, as things get different outside of the norm, uh, again, you can put thresholds. If we're um, double norm, that might be the first level, low level of threshold. If we're, you know, again, doubled, that might be the next level. And again, double, a level over that. So uh, thresholds keep you from getting into trouble. Here's an example from very recently, actually, of a disaster that occurred. So at 4.02, one Friday afternoon, anytime you get an alert on Friday afternoon, by the way, this is what I learned from this, pay really, really, if, I don't, if something bad happens, it will happen like Friday night or sometime into Saturday uh, when no one's paying attention. Uh, so 4.02, Friday. Uh, an alert came in, disk at 85%. Uh, a guy, we'll call him Jim, he acknowledged the alert, and he actually left a note with the acknowledgement. I'll keep my eye on this. Well, I'm sure he did. I, I actually think he did. He went off his shift at 6 p.m., and the weekend guys went on. They're um, offshore people, uh, and their job is just to keep things kind of up and running throughout the weekend. And on Monday morning at 8.35 a.m., the server crashed. Are these two things related? It doesn't seem like that, and it didn't seem like that, 
right? But what we did was we looked at why the server crashed. The server crashed because one of the disks, this disk actually, completely filled up. And we were like, that's weird. Jim said he was looking at that on Friday and no more alerts came in. Well, the alerting system, as it turns out, um, only alerts when things go over the threshold. And as soon as you clear it, uh, done. It actually has to, the alerting system we're running, which is not Red Gates product, I'm not sure if it has this same behavior, actually, but uh, you can ask later. Um, what we want to have happen is, or what it, what it did, I'm sorry, is it only sends another alert if things dip back down below. Uh, and so now you have an interesting situation. Here's what actually occurred when we looked at the chart. Uh, very, very, very slowly, over the course of the entire weekend, the disk utilization kept going up and up and up, just creeping up just a little bit. It was almost imperceptible to Jim on Friday afternoon that this was even happening. So he just said, oh, it's no problem. Cleared the alert, but in the weekend, people never received any alert. So by Monday morning, crashed. And you know what caused this? This is a, actually a kind of funny thing. The software that caused this is something I don't even think should be on production SQL servers, which was an antivirus program was running. And I don't even know what it was storing often some kind of temporary files, but it was just creating file after file after file all weekend long. Boom, toast. So as for whether or not you should run antivirus, that's probably way out of the scope of this talk. So we'll discuss that later. But anyway, the point is, if there have been multiple alert thresholds, if we get to add one at 85, and then another one at 90 or 95 or something, and then another one at 98, this wouldn't have been an issue at all. The weekend guys would have seen it, and we would have dealt with it. So. Fire, but don't forget, and make sure you keep firing if the alert continues, all right? In SQL Monitor, the way we can do this is uh, we can put thresholds in. Um, all the alerts can be configured, low, medium, and high. Um, here, instead of doing percentages, I've done uh, gigs and megs. And again, I think that's a slightly better way to fly, because then you can do uh, different configurations depending on the size of your disk and so on, all right? So next thing, alerts must be tested. How many of you would put code in production without testing it? Oh, come on. <laughs> I hope, OK, go home. Um, so look, no one, I, I would hope, I really hope that no one would put some code in production without testing it. Um, you know, an alerting system, your monitoring system, is a production system. And it's not only a production system, it's quite possibly the most important of your production systems because its job is to keep your other production systems from failing your business. So this, by putting your monitoring system in production without testing it, you are putting code in production without testing it unwittingly. And I can't even tell you how many times I've heard, oops, I thought we had an alert for that. Um, no, you didn't. You didn't try it, or the alert didn't work. Or I mean, you really should know what you're monitoring and try to test it. Now, it can be tricky to test it, but it's doable. Um, so make your alerts. So everyone cares about disk, CPU, network, and then memory. Um, exercise them. You know, uh, Put alerts in place. Fill up your disks. Make sure you're getting the alerts. Make sure you're getting the right thresholds. Exercise your CPU. Uh, by the way, I just published, unrelated to this, I just published a script on my blog the other day that will allow you to exercise the CPU within um, SQL Server on a fairly configurable manner. So use that script if you want. Exercise your CPU. Exercise your network. Um, use um, Iometer is a free disk tool that you can run. If you want to exercise the network, just have it exercise a disk on a remote server. Done. You're now exercising your network. Do all these things. Go in and unplug the server. See what the monitoring software does. I've actually seen monitoring softwares stop monitoring when they can't talk to the server. This, one of Redgate's competitor's products literally just stopped sending anything. Well, I can't talk to the server. There's nothing wrong happening, obviously. Um, so please test it. Do not say oops, because that just means you haven't done your job. All right, sorry. <laughs> All right, let's move on. The observer effect. Uh, this is a situation where we're trying to monitor for performance problems, and we're creating our own performance problems in so doing. Or we're creating some other problems. Maybe they're not performance. Maybe 
there's something else. This is something we want to avoid, obviously, <laughs> because all we're doing is exacerbating the situation. Uh, this is most often caused when people go in and try to go too crazy with their monitoring solution. This is one of the reasons I say don't monitor for a bunch of stuff that you don't know what it means. Uh, I've seen people, you know, there's a performance problem or something, and they'll go into perfmon, and they'll just check everything. And well, obviously, I'll catch the problem, because I'm catching everything. Uh, no, you're not. You're just confusing yourself. <laughs> so uh, keep it simple. Monitor for just a few little things that you need, and don't put too much load on the server. And you can avoid this situation, and you can keep your own sanity at the same time. So it's a really nice trade-off, isn't it? I think so. Um, the other thing that can cause the observer effect is products that do things they're not supposed to do. So what you want to do is watch out for a few red flags. Here they are. If your product requires XP command shell, XP, oh, I see, it's when I get near this microphone. There we go. Look at that. If your product requires, eh, it just got worse. If your, how do I turn it off? Yes. <laughs> All right, I unplugged the server and we can see it worked. So, if your product, oh no, it's not that, damn, no. Um, if your product requires XP command shell, okay, it's 2012, right? XP command shell has been deprecated. It's actually been locked down since 2005. Even before 2005, it was relatively useless. Uh, but there's at least one product, and probably more, I know of on the market that use it. And they go out and they make you turn on XP command shell so that their monitoring product can run, which is craziness if you think about it. You have to reduce security so that you can monitor for stuff. And I don't even know, what are they running with XP command shell that you can't get from WMI? Related is SPOA. SP, those are the object automation store procedures. Those have been known since SQL Server 2000 at least to cause memory leaks uh, and other issues. Uh, yet there's a product, a very popular product that's on the market that uses that. So they actually make you go in and turn that on. It's disabled by default. You have to go in and turn that on so their product can capture information that they can capture using publicly available WMI APIs much more cheaply and much more effectively without uh, damaging your server, and furthermore, that product, you have to give them SA <laughs> um, because SPOA requires, even, once you turn it on, it requires SA. So now you have to give this vendor's product the keys to the kingdom on your server. That's a big, big, big red flag, don't you think? I do. That gives me pause. Another issue is traces. This is probably the biggest issue inside of SQL Server that you can cause. Uh, if you have a trace and it's on a statement completed event and you have a function, let's say a scalar function in a query. Let's say that your query returns a million rows and um, let's say that in the select list you call that scalar function to do some kind of calculation. How many SP statement completed events are you going to receive? Uh, well, close. Close to a million and one. Uh, it actually depends on how many statements are in the scalar function. If the scalar function has three statements <laughs> and you have a million rows, now you're getting three million rows coming back in your trace, three million events. And guess what happens if the trace can't write out fast enough? Your whole server slows to a crawl and you now have a big, big, big problem on your hands. One of the products on the market that I know of has caused, for customers I've seen, lots and lots of trouble due to the fact that it spins up a trace every once in a while with that event in it, and they run their queries, or it's just normal activity, and it's just like, it's bad. So if your products are doing these things, scream at your vendors. That's it. <laughs> All right, another one, test and development servers. I am a developer by trade, so this is a very sensitive area for me. Um, companies treat their test and development servers like they don't matter at all. Uh, quite often, they're totally, totally, totally under spec um, I was actually working on a while back, maybe five years ago, I was working on a data warehouse, and they hired um, this big consulting firm that's uh, in my area. Um, those guys sent eight people, and then there were a few of us from other consulting firms 
they were also there. And I figured that the big firm, I know they charge like somewhere upwards of $300 an hour. Um, so I figured the billable in the room was something like you know, around $3,000 an hour or something like that. Um, they had a production server for this. This is a company that makes a ton of money. They had a production server uh, that was on a pretty beefy machine at the time. I think it had like 32 cores. It was on a dedicated SAN, so on and so forth. They had us all developing against a single shared copy of the data warehouse on a four core VM with like 32 gigs of RAM or something like that. We, it was the kind of thing where we would actually run a query and then all of us would walk out and go have a cup of coffee together. Uh, so it would be like, hey, uh, you running a query right now? No, I'm good. Okay, I'm gonna run one, so let's go. Take a break. <laughs> Uh, the amount of money, and we said, we, we brought this up in meetings. Sorry, nope, it's not in the budget. The amount of money wasted on this thing was incredible. Um, even worse is when you don't monitor these servers. So maybe you actually bought a good server, but you're not monitoring it. Well, what you're saying by not monitoring that is that you don't care if it has a problem. And if you don't care it has a problem, that means you don't care if you, your company wastes a lot of time and money because developers can't do their job. You're actually condoning having the developers send you a letter like this one. <laughs> That's how I feel. That's how I as a developer feel when the server goes down and you're not paying attention to it. And you, when I say you, I'm assuming that there are some infrastructure people in the room. <laughs> so I'm talking to you. Monitor the servers or your developers are watching YouTube videos and going home early, okay? Don't let this happen, unless you have YouTube locked down, in which case they're going to just bring out their cell phone and watch YouTube on there. So just keep that in mind, all right? Final thing, what happens if your monitoring server goes down? Who's gonna watch production? Hmm, well, this is a kind of a, this is a quandary, isn't it? Because like, how do we, oh, now we need a monitoring server to monitor the monitoring server. We need a monitoring server to monitor the monitoring server, monitoring server. <laughs> and okay, so here's my suggestion. This is something I thought of a few months ago, and I put it into place um, in a couple situations, and I think it works pretty well. Monitor the monitoring server with the production database server. Now don't monitor everything. Just, just a ping that runs uh, using an agent job or something, just a ping that runs once every 10 minutes, something like that. Just occasional, just make sure it's up. And it can send using database mail uh, an alert if it's down. That's all it is. It's just a very, very lightweight, trust me, it's not gonna affect <laughs> your server at all. It's just something that runs once every 10 minutes. And this kind of uh, works out pretty well because now you don't need another server. You know that the most important server, which is probably the database server, uh, is being monitored. And you know that if the thing that's not monitoring it, or that's supposed to be monitoring it, is not monitoring it, you're gonna find out about it, all right? So I think this is a simple solution, lets you monitor the monitoring server without bringing a bunch of additional muscle in-house. All right? So, SQL Monitor. A couple really cool things with this product. Number one, monitor.redgate.com, you get to go and look at um, actual live monitoring from SQL Server Central and SimpleTalk. I'm not aware of any other um, monitoring vendors that like dog food their products in such a cool way. Um, this is the best possible way to learn about SQL Monitor. Go use it. Go um, look at the bad code that's driving SQL Server Central and SimpleTalk. Actually, it's not that bad, but um, I can make fun of them. And another thing that's really cool, and I've been waiting for years for a monitoring company to uh, come up with this is uh, an open metrics library. So you can go out, you can write some code that's a, a metric, you can upload it to this library, and then anyone else can go and benefit from your knowledge. And if you think about it, the collective knowledge of the community is obviously much greater than any monitoring company could possibly amass in-house. And this really scales things up and lets uh, people share we love to share in the SQL Server world. This lets people share their knowledge and lets everyone benefit. I think this is very, very cool stuff and I look forward to a lot more of that from Redgate. Sir. Sorry, so those metrics, I'm assuming they're only working on SQL monitors. Mm. They're T-SQL uh, queries. 
What I'd actually like to see <laughs> is SQL Monitor implement a formula uh, builder that would let you do time series measurements for proper baselining, and um, then it would only work in SQL Monitor, but um, that's just me, and I'm not even associated with Redgate, so uh, <laughs> my wish is not their command. But um, yeah, but it's, they're just SQL queries, so you can go and plug it into any monitoring tool that accepts SQL queries. So, but yeah, you should plug it into SQL Monitor, because it's cooler, right? Okay, I guess. Anyway, that's pretty much all I have to say. So um, in summary, I want to make your alerts actionable, actionable, actionable. Not too many. You want to actually test the things just like any other production code. You want to monitor everything. And you want to relax and enjoy a good night's sleep without worrying that the pager is going to start buzzing. Thank you. <laughs>